Well, thank you, Lewis. Um, and uh, the music and worship was really nice, and the um, latter part of the worship just fits in so perfectly with what um, we're going to share together today. Um, I've got my water here. I don't like your water. It's got too much chlorine in it, so I've bought my own water. I've had a um, bit of a rough time this week. The weather's been so cold, hasn't it? So nice to see the sunshine again, and summer's back. Praise the Lord. But it got really cold there. I felt colder last week than I felt for a long, long time, all through winter. And um, because Susanna works in an environment where she's um, picking up a lot of bugs herself, she passed them on to me. And um, I always tend to get these things much worse than she does, and so I've been really laid down badly with a kind of a flu thing. I'm over it now, so there's no germs being spread. I'm quite clear that way, but it's left a bit of a cough. And so I might leave my water close by, and Jordan, if you see me reach for my lolly, it's not actually a lolly. I'm just going to open it now so I don't make a big noise. I have to do it part way through this. Um, if I get a coughing fit, I've got some, some helps and some aids here to help me this morning. What I, what I want to talk about this morning is something that's exercised my mind for... Is that Nairi? Nairi Crokin that was? Wow, nice to see you. I was looking up here and I said to these guys, is that Nairi? And they said, yeah, well, it's a Nairi. Uh, it's so nice to see you guys. Yeah, good one. Uh, what do I talk about? After spending, uh, counting the training and so on, 40 years uh, in ministry, to come to an end of that and suddenly, and, and Ken, you'll, you'll identify a little what I'm saying, I'm sure. To, to come to an end of that and suddenly, like I did, move into, because I went back to my electrical trade for a couple of years, um, I sort of always had a dream, wanted to have a little business, so I thought I'd do that in my late retirement, and just to satisfy my own, what, dreams that I had years ago. So I did that, and do you know what? It was very, very difficult making a transition from ministry to secular work. In, in, in the sense that you, you have the concept that, that ministry is a very high calling and suddenly you're doing something of lesser value. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm saying this is how I felt. And uh, yeah, I, I, one, of the, one of the most difficult things I found and, uh, was to charge people. You know, uh, all, all my life I was giving, 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 and then all of a sudden... I was in a position where, where now I'm charging for my time and my services. And I used to look at my accounts and I'd go over and over. And, oh, I can't charge that much. That's awful. You know, I really struggled with that. And, and in the last few years, I've, I've worked together some of the things I'm going to share with you today because it's really been my, my journey, if you like, in retirement, switching from ministry to another form of life. And I want to share that with you this morning because I'm sure it'll help us because what I'm doing today, I'm really looking at what I would suggest is the real nuts and bolts of what it means to be a Christian. That's what I'm looking at today. I want to start with John 1. Come turn to your Bibles to John chapter 1 and uh, verse 1. John 1 and verse 1. It says here, and uh, yeah, thank you. I'll just um, do something like that, or maybe I should go this way. And I'll let you know already. Okay, thanks. Okay, John 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. I particularly want to look at that expression, that phrase, the Word with God. With God. And that's the topic of what I want to talk about today, is with God. Here the Apostle is reminding us that before this little world came into existence, and uh, uh, before we arrived here, um, the word, Jesus, was in fellowship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. A, a, a fellowship, I like the word, Godhead. A fellowship of the Godhead together. And then as you, you read through Scripture, you find Adam and Eve. When they were there in the garden, it said that um, God came and walked with them. With God, see? With them. And, and as you go through Abraham, he was called out of Ur, you remember, and, and he, was, he was a bit worried about the events of what was going to happen. Apprehensive is a probably a better word. And God says, don't worry, I will be with you. And you find the same thing with Moses. When Moses was called, he was there 
uh, in the wilderness and he had lost all his confidence about facing the Egyptians and he was asked to go back there and he was terrified. And God says, don't worry, I will be with you. And you, and you find that over and over again. I'm going to have trouble with that, so I'll put it down there. Over and over again, God with him. You find it in David. You remember David as he was uh, being called to, to become the king. God says, I will be with you. The sanctuary, when they, they built the sanctuary, uh, God said to the Israel, he said, make a sanctuary. It was really only a tent structure. Make the tent because I want to, what? Dwell with you. And uh, you, you find the same thing in John. Back at John, we started from verse 14. Uh, it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt with us. The word dwelt is actually tabernacle. Tabernacle dwell is the same thing. Jesus said, I want a tabernacle with you. That's why it was called a tabernacle. It represented God's people were there with God. And so, of course, when Jesus came, we didn't need the tabernacle anymore because now God was with us in Jesus Christ. And then you finally have in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, it says there that uh, Jesus made the promise before he left. He says, I will be what? With you right to the very end of time. And so, so there's, there's the promise of God being, God being with us. It's a simple preposition, with. It shows the position we are with somebody else. God with us. And the closest parallel you can have to this, I guess, is in marriage. You're with your, your spouse. That's the closest relationship that humans know. You can have that other sort of friendship, you know, amongst um, uh, unmarried people have friends, special friends as well. We talked about that in our Sabbath school class today. But that, that closeness between husband and wife is a very, very close association and is very much parallel to the same association that God wants to be with us or God is with us. And so what's so important about this is that living with God changes the way we see our circumstance. That's my first point. You know, three points, that's all we're going to have this morning. I've got no idea how long I'm going to take today because I've never done this before. So we're in, in virgin territory. <laughs> so living with God changes the way we see our circumstances. Now, I, I know that many times we say, in my ministry I've experienced this so many times, people say, if only I could change my circumstances then I could experience God more fully. Have you ever done that in your life? If only I could change my circumstances. Acts chapter 16. You go to Acts chapter 16, you'll see the story there of Paul and Silas. They were in a little place called Philippi. And they were preaching the gospel in Philippi. And there was this girl, she was a slave girl it says, but she had a tremendous gift of being able to foretell the future. And Paul saw in her that she had an evil spirit. And she was going around predicting people's uh, future and uh, these people who owned her were making a great fortune out of her. And it was, it was very interesting when you read the story there because the, the girl was saying things like, um, she was almost selling Paul and Silas to the people. She was saying, this is the man that is from God. He's presenting God's message and we want you to listen to him. It was amazing that the devil was saying all this stuff through this girl. And this went on and on, and, and Paul just got jack of it. And he turned to the girl and he says, Come out of her, you evil spirit. And it did. And of course, dare I say it, there were union representatives back there too. <laughs> and they kicked up a great fuss. We're losing our income. As they had poor, poor, poor old poor and Paul and Silas were, it says their clothes were stripped off and they were beaten and thrown into prison with their legs put into stocks and the doors locked. And what were they doing? Singing songs of praises and praying to God. And then at midnight it happened, a miracle. An earthquake, Christ church all over again. This was a pretty violent earthquake because the door of the prison just burst open and the stocks were broken off their legs and they were free. And when the jailer of the place recovered from the earthquake, 
He saw that the door was open. He took out his sword and he was about to commit suicide. As he was about to fall on his sword, Paul and Silas cried out, Don't do it! Don't kill yourself! We're here. We're alive. And you remember how his reaction, he was so overwhelmed that he says, Wow, I want to be like you guys. What have you got? Now, I want to ask the question this morning. That's not the question there. It's, uh, it's coming up. Well, I'm waving my hands too much. Sorry about that. <laughs> I caught you out. But I want to ask you a question. Why didn't Paul and Silas run away when those doors opened? If that had been me, I tell you what, if that had been me, and I was praying and worshipping God, and all of a sudden there was this great earthquake, and the door suddenly opened, I tell you what, you wouldn't see me for dust. I'd be gone. Why didn't they go? You know why they didn't go? Because what they sought most in life, what their whole life revolved around, was being with God. And God was right with them there in the prison cell. Why bother going? So they remained there. And that was what changed the heart of that prisoner when these guys stayed there. And so my point is, living with God changes the way we see our circumstances. And you see how that's a, a beautiful illustration of what we're talking about here. And it says, and Paul writes in another place, he said, I, was, I know Jesus Christ. And the word he used there is not a cognitive word, a, 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 a mental exercise, a mental doctrine of knowing all about Jesus, how he died and how he suffered and how he was buried and how he rose. It's not that kind of a knowing. It's an experiential knowing. I know him. He's with me. He's real. That, that's how, how Paul, that's why he didn't go out of the jail, because he, he, was knew, he knew that he was right there with him. I um, now want to ask you a question, this one. If nothing changed in your life, and I don't want you to answer, but just think about it. If nothing changed in your life, do you believe you can still experience the fullness of God right now? This is rather a harsh question for some people because I know that some of you are living in a prison cell right now. Some of you are. It can be all sorts of things. And from my 40 years of ministerial experience, some of the top prison cells around that people live in today are financial stress. It's not easy when, you, when, you, when you, you're under financial stress to experience fully the presence of God in your life. You can say, oh, but it makes me turn to God. Yeah, yeah, it may do. But it's hard to feel that joy. You don't feel like singing songs of praise. I know a family over in Perth we know very well. And um, while we were there in Perth, they started up in a business, family business it was. It went so well, so well. We just heard from the other day, the whole lot's gone down the tubes. Things have gone, no fault of their own. Things have gone so terribly wrong. They've lost the whole business. They've lost their house. They've lost everything. The only thing they have is the clothes. A number of little kids in the family as well. It's such a sad case. Prison house. Family breakdowns. Remember a couple we knew well in Melbourne. They were dynamic folks in the church too. Well, they're amazing folks. Adrian and Kerry, you, you, you won't know them, but... Uh, they did such a, and had such beautiful kids. She got involved, I don't know how it happened, but she got involved in the internet, communicating with people, you know, emails. Found this guy over in Austria. Started a communication going, and a friendship developed. And from that it grew. Nobody knew, he, even the husband didn't know what was going on. She went over to see him. That was it. Whole family broken. The distress, prison cell experience for them. How can you know God intimately in that situation? What about people from a one Christian family? A, a partner is not a, a Christian or your spouse is not a Christian. That's not easy. That's very, very difficult. And I, I think of uh, young people have this kind of expression. You hear it so often. Uh, I don't know about here, you guys, but it all happens overseas. Nothing ever happens here. God is working over there. And I've got to go there. I want to say it's good to go there. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's good to expand our views and broaden our horizons. Yes, but don't make into the trap, form of the trap that God only works there. 
another interesting one. Church is boring. Why can't we have a more vibrant church? Then we could experience God more fully. I have to say that sometimes it works the other way too. I know that one of the things that I've interested to watch is that sometimes people say we wish church was less vibrant. <laughs> That's another one that goes around today. Or illness. What about illness? I, I remember my dear mother. My mother was a wonderful person in many ways, but she didn't have the best of health. And I remember her saying this often. If only I had better health, then I could experience God more fully. If only I had better health. Next point. What's happened? We've gone. We've lost them all. Ooh, that's it there. <laughs> remember your circumstances do not define you. Very important point. Your circumstances do not define you. What defines Susanna in my eyes for me? What is it that defines? Is it the way she cooks? Yeah, she cooks not too bad. But there, is, <laughs> there are some times when things go terribly wrong. And, and, I, and I want to tell you something, you know, because it, she's working and I work at home mostly now. And so I'm expected to do dinner on... Um, I do it on Monday and Tuesday and sometimes Thursday nights. Now, if I get occupied doing something, I'm, I'm a sort of a, like men are far more focused on a thing than women. I get focused on a job, I get focused on it, and I forget the time. And she'll walk in, you know, about six o'clock, and I tell you what, I can know immediately what's going on in her mind. The look is enough. You see? No, it's not that. that is, is it her care that she gives me and her, her way that she treats me? Yeah, but she sometimes treats me a bit rough. <laughs> it does. You know, she, she spends more time doing the women's ministries than looking after me. So it's not that. Do you know what defines our relationship? It's because I love her. That's what defines the relationship between myself and Susanna. And that's what's so important for us to understand with God. You know, my, my education, I, I, I am amazed in this country. I am amazed in this country. And this is more so than any other place I've ever been, more than Australia. People define people here by the car they drive. They do. You're defined by the type of car they drive. Can you imagine how I feel in my little old esteemer van I go driving around in. Man, we define people in these ways. We define them by their job that they do. We shouldn't define people that way. You know, um, this was brought on me in Papua New Guinea. We were out there and um, I used to go around the field a lot. I was the ministerial secretary for the union. I used to go around different, different states. Some I go to the long outpost stations. And some of these places you could fly in and you'd have to walk sometimes one or two days to get to the places where you wanted to go to. Going in was good, but coming out was not so good. You'll see why in a moment. But you, you would go there and that place lays on your head and they would sing songs and everybody was... You, you were like a king. What it did for my self-esteem visiting these places, I can't tell you. It was just wonderful. Now, I was the man. And I remember one time I was at this village that has a very vivid... left a very vivid impression on my life. We went to the village there and as we were there, we received, received the lays and they were singing and they were welcoming us there to their, their village and often it involved eating some food as a gift and this lady came along with a, uh, a, a, um, a banana leaf in her hand and three cooked cobs of corn for, for, for me to eat and I can still see her now she's walking towards me and she's got a little boy he must be about ten walking beside her and he had number eleven now, you don't know what number 11 is, but number 11 in pigeon talk is, you know, when you have a heavy cold and it, that awful-looking green and yellow stuff runs out your nose? Okay, I don't need to say too much more. You got the picture, and it was out both nostrils, and they call it number 11. You got number 11. And this little boy had really bad number 11. And Papua New Guinea people don't have handkerchiefs. And so as she was walking along, getting close to me all the time, I could see this. And she put her hand around his nose and wiped it all like this and then rubbed it on her lap lap. And then just about that point, she's right up with me. And so she picks up the same hand, picks up a piece of corn, 
and passes it to me to eat. You have to eat it. I remember just in my eyes open, just asking God, please God, something like this. We're asking all to get a pass and he stopped no good and so long this fellow, kai kai. That means, Lord, I want you to kill any bugs that are in this guy. <laughs> I tell you what, deli belly, you don't know what deli belly is till you've been in those places. That's why walking out was so, so difficult. Awful, awful. But the thing is I want to tell you about that was I used to sometimes go and visit the same places or other places for, for my electrical knowledge. Generators would break down or the power wouldn't work in a particular mission station. They'd fly me in to fix it up. When I was flown into those places to fix those places up, there was nobody there to welcome me. No lays, no singing. I was just an electrician, a nobody. See, because in their thinking, in their, in their mentality, and I guess we are to blame for that as, as Europeans going up there, we taught them that ministerial work was a more holier work. It had higher value than being an electrician. And that's why there was no lays, no working committee, because I was just an electrician. I want to ask you, ask you a question now, and you can show your hands on this one. And don't be embarrassed. How many of you this week have done something in service for God, like uh, might be something very, you know, like we used to in the old days, how many missions helped, how many persons helped, hours of Christian, that sort of thing. I opened the door for an old man in the surgery uh, the other day, and, uh, you know, that sort of thing, something that you do for somebody else. How many did something like that this week for somebody else? Good, okay, all right. That's nice to see, yeah. Now I want to ask you this question, particularly to the guys. How many of you did something seriously domestic in your house this week? Serious, not just the dishes, but something seriously domestic. Not so many hands up, but some up, okay. Now, let me ask you this question. Which is more important to God, the first one or the second? Hmm? Both, exactly. Yet, but how often? Subconsciously, like the Papua New Year, we're not quite as blatant as those, but how often do we place those things that we do like outreach and that, as more holy, pious for God. Friends, if God's with us, everything we do is for God. Everything we do. You know, I love what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther was asked by a new convert, asked him, uh, now that I've become a Christian, what should I do? And he's meaning, what sort of work should I do? And Martin Luther turned to him and he said, what do you do? And he said, I make shoes. And Martin Luther says, go back and make shoes and make the best shoes you can and sell them at a fair price. Isn't that good? That's cool. I'll use an illustration because when I was getting this ready, I, I, I thought of you, Lewis. Where is he? Yeah. I thought of Lewis. I should have asked you before I used this illustration, but I'm going to do it anyway. I had to see Lewis one day, it was years ago. It was about the time he was first setting up that mill at Hikarangi. And I went in there and there was Lewis. He had these old overalls on. He was covered in dust from head to foot. Up there in the machinery. And he, 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 he looked absolutely exhausted. I want to tell you something here. There is far more dignity, far more dignity in Lewis doing that if God is with him than me standing up the front here in a nice suit without him if I'm doing that. I knew it was going to go one day, but you notice how quick I got it back again? <laughs> See what I'm getting at? And, and, and one, of, one of the greatest things about being... Um, old as you get grandchildren. Aren't they, those of us who are grandparents, aren't they wonderful? I just love, I've only got one, but I love him just the same. And you know, I, I, I sometimes have to look after him when Carl and Flora are not there. And Carl said to me one day, he said, I hope when I go out one of these days that he's going to do my most pooiest nappy you've ever experienced. And one day he did. And I've learned that unless you've got everything all highly organized, everything's there within your reach, but not too close, it's a disaster. I was changing him this day, and I tell you what, the mess. He moved and jumped up. 
I won't even describe what it was like. <laughs> but I want to tell you, friends, that a mother changing a pooey nappy, there is just as much dignity in that work than doing it with God than for me standing up here and talking to you if I'm doing it without God. Just as much. More, in fact. See, we get our priorities mixed up sometimes. We think unless we're doing holy work, that we're not doing God's work. As a Christian, everything we do is God's work. Everything we do. And that's where the third point comes in. The third point now is uh, that living with God changes the way we see ourselves, our self-worth, if we're living with God. You know, sometimes people who go to church we've changed the preposition. And instead of being living with God, we teach to live for God. There's a subtle difference. And for years in my ministry, I had an unnatural dichotomy between what was spiritual and what was secular. And so spiritual things were like preaching, running seminars, keeping the Sabbath, in-gathering, Bible study, prayer, all these things sound good, don't they? Nothing wrong with them, they're good. And don't misunderstand me. What we do for God is important. What we do for God is important. And God's great mission should also become our mission. But more glorious it is to live with God than for Him. Because when you're living with Him, it becomes a natural process of the life. I'll tell you why. Because Steps to Christ, Ellen G. White made a beautiful statement. She said, our promises and our resolutions are like ropes of sand. I want to ask you this question. How many times have you decided in your life that I'm going to have a new devotional life? I'm going to spend a few minutes every morning before I start the day to read the Bible, and I'm going to have a prayer, and I'm going to, start, I'm going to do that. How long has it lasted? I see you grinning and nodding. Yeah, not very long. And we start another one, and we start all over again. That's because we're living for God. If we're living with God, it just becomes a natural process. And it's not necessarily actually physically kneeling that's prayer. It's prayer in the heart all the time with God. You're living with him. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a husband and wife. You're always there together in life. And it's a similar process. Because the danger is that if we live for God, we're under what I call the older brother syndrome. You know what that is? Luke 15. Remember Luke 15? Just quickly, the prodigal son story, you remember? He took off. And when he came back, the father was so happy, he threw a party. Wow, a party. They were all happy. The older brother was ticked off. He wasn't going to go to the party. So his father went looking for him. And his father said, son, what's the matter? And you notice what this older brother did. He began to demonstrate that his roots and his identity were in what he had done. You see that? His roots and identity. Father, I've always been with you. I've done this, I've done that, and I've done everything else. I've done all these things. I never left you like that little brother. See, he, his roots and identity is what he has done for God, for his father, what he's done. What he's done is what was important to him. And I love the father's response in the story. The father said to him, and I imagine he said to Jenny, he said, son, you're always with me. The most important thing is not your obedience and not what you've done, but you're with me. That's what's important. Your brother has been an idiot. He was a jerk, but he's back. And what matters most is not what you do, but that you are with me. That's what I care most about. That's what God's like with us. You know, one of the most saddest words in the Bible, in that passage in Matthew 7, 22, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you remember? Jesus turned around to the religious people of his day and he said, you'll come to me and say, we have prophesied in your name. Remember that prophesied in your name? Does that ring a bell for us? All concerned about prophecy. You've done all these wonderful things, but I never knew you. Why? Because they are so busy living for God that they forgot what is most important to live with God. 
And that's what I've discovered in my journey since leaving ministries. When we live with God, you know, we, we, we live in an exhibitionist culture, don't we? A cultural age of exhibitionist. We, we, we like to, what have we achieved? What's, what's our worth is what we achieve. Sports people, see, we look up to them. They've achieved fame. And so we, we tend to look up to them. That's why a lot of people go on to Facebook. It's so popular. Facebook. People want to be noticed. People want to be seen. I know it's a way of communication, yes, and it's, it has quite value that way. But it's even more that because people want to be noticed. Twitter and blogging is the same thing. People want to be recognized. So we go onto these sites and so on. Whereas the Christian culture is quite different. Our worth is measured by something that we can never measure. And that is my hidden, and I think this is on the screen. That is our, our hidden private. Oh yeah, okay, I thought there was one before. My hidden private communion with God. Notice that? My hidden intimate private communication with God. You know what's most neglected in the Christian world? I've done a research on this fairly recently in the Christian world. You know what I think that's most neglected in Christian homes today, in Christian lives? It's prayer. Prayer. That's what's most neglected. I'm not talking about formal prayer. We do that often. The type of prayer I'm referring to is when um, uh, Saul, when he was converted, he had that experience, you remember? And Ananias was asked to go and talk to him. And he didn't want to go. And the reply came to the prophet, it's okay, he's in the closet, you pray him. Nobody prays in the closet unless their heart is in tune with God. You don't do that. Or I can pray publicly, I can use the most beautiful words, even around family worship I can pray. But do I get in the closet and pray like Paul? He prayeth. That kind of prayer comes from the heart. really does. And uh, so that, that's the kind of culture. I, I, I love what, um, what Billy Graham, his experience that he had. He was having an interview. This is years ago. Uh, a big media conference was to interview him. And as they came into the room, uh, the, uh, the assistant, um, Billy Graham's assistant, was leading the way. And one of the media people took him aside and said, excuse me, we know that Billy Graham's a man of prayer. Uh, we've got a prayer room over here. If you'd like to go and then just rest and you can pray in there before the interview, he's welcome. And I love what the assistant said. You know what he said? He said, when Billy Graham woke up this morning, the first thing he did, he was praying. When Billy Graham was getting dressed for this interview, he was praying. When Billy Graham was riding in the car to come to this place, he was praying. And Billy Graham is going to pray right through the whole interview. Thank you for the room, but no thanks, we won't need it. Isn't that beautiful? That's what it's about. And here's an interesting quote that I read it by, from Thomas Kelly. He was a Quaker. He said this. He said, there is a way of organizing our mental life on more than one level. A bit like, um, do you understand about fiber optic cable? Fiber optic cable, you know, the wires that we have are copper, mostly to our houses. And you can only carry two or three signals down the same wire. But fiber optic cable, you can carry thousands of signals down the same wire. Amazing stuff. Amazing. A bit like fiber optic cable. Saying our mind's a bit like that. On one level, we may operate on the daily activities of life, but deep within and behind this activity, we may be also conscious of being in the abiding presence of God. Wow. That's living with God. See? Living with God. We know there's a place for formal prayer. We know there's a place for doing all this stuff, but living in the abiding presence for God. And you know something I, I should have said before was that... Um, God can use anybody to do stuff for him, can't he? God can use anybody. Remember in the Old Testament, he used an ass to speak to Balaam. And as my uh, friend in Melbourne said to me once, he said, he said to me, he used to have me on a bit sometimes and say some nasty things to me. And he said, Lynn, he said, you know what? He said, God used an ass in the Old Testament to speak to people, and he's still using an ass every Sabbath morning. I wasn't very flat at the time, but I knew he was only having a joke. But you see what I mean, can't you? Sir? God can use anybody to do stuff for him. But he can't use anybody unless we're willing to walk with him. It's got to come from us. So where does sin fit in here? I can see some of your minds ticking over and thinking, well, where does sin fit in here? Remember the, the, uh, the word for sin. 
just soften up a little. The word for sin that Paul uses was hamatia. It was a, a term that was used for archery. I know you pull the bow back. And if, if you ever pull one of those proper bows, Papua New Guinea, these little guys shoot these men. I had a guy and I could only pull about that far and I couldn't pull any more. They get to go, and I think, wow, how do they do that? But you pull the bow right back and let it go. And if you miss the bullseye, hamatia, miss the mark. That's where the word sin comes from in Romans. Paul used that way. Missing the mark. So what about our lives in missing the mark? Missing the mark. I want to suggest to you that my experience is we have seen already that God doesn't assess us by our circumstances. Nor does he define us by what we do, be it good or bad. God does not define us by what we do, whether it be good or bad. And I don't care what you've been taught in the past, because I was not taught that in the past. I was taught that I am defined by being good or bad. The Bible doesn't teach that. We're not defined by being good or bad. Remember this, God doesn't play the life according to our games. God doesn't play the game according to our rules. He doesn't play the game according to our rules. I, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I had the... You know, that there's a song that goes, it says, um, words don't come easy. I wish I had the words to be able to express, and I, I pray God, before I take a sermon every day, to try and give me the words to speak that can make what I'm saying clear, not be misunderstood. Remember, you're with God. It doesn't mean to say you're going to go out and do anything else, but God does not define us by missing the mark. That's what I'm trying to say. God does not define us by missing the mark. So many young people have lost their way because that's how we've been brought up. God does not define us because we miss the mark. You know what you're defined by? Here's the next point, one last point. You're defined by the fact that you're a child of God and he loves you dearly. He loves you dearly. That's how you are defined as a Christian. I only would to God that I was brought up with that kind of an understanding, that God loved me dearly and I was not defined by the good things or the bad things that I did. This must be the center and the core of our Christian life. Difficult to express, yes, but it's got to come into our hearts and come into our lives. Colossians 3. I'll finish with this. Colossians 3 and verses 1 down to verse 4. And tying that with the well-known passage we have in John, with the God so loved the world passage that we know so well. It says there in Colossians, it says, Since then you have been raised with Jesus. Why well, was he saying that we're raised? He's saying since then, you and I, we've all been raised with Jesus. And he goes on and says, Because you died. How did we die? We died in Jesus. My penalty of punishment for sin was made out right there on the cross. I've paid the price. That's what Jesus is all about. And then he says, since then you've been raised with Jesus, for you died. And then he goes, and your life is hidden with Jesus in God. Have you thought that for a moment? Our life is hidden with Jesus in God. And remember what God thinks of Jesus? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son. See how much he loves us? We are in Jesus. We are hidden, it says, in Jesus. And therefore, we are God's beloved children. He does not define us whether we're good or bad. Just think of David. He would define David whether he's good or bad. Just imagine what would have happened to David. He would have been kicked out of the throne years ago. God does not define us whether we're good or bad. He defines us as being loving children of his. And that's why he goes on, the Passion Colossians goes on and says, therefore, set your mind on things above. See the order? See the order because you realize you're a child of God and you're deeply loved by God. Then you'll set your mind on things above. Wow! What a difference. We would be, never be judgmental of others if we could live like that, friends. Never be judgmental of others if we live like that. And I've learned this in my, in my own experience in life through the ministry and so on and coming out into a secular way of life. 
that I'm just as much in tune with God, I'm just as much loved by God as when I was a minister doing, in quotes, the great work, is what I am being an electrician. In my dirty overalls sometimes, in my grubby hands, or in my filthy, dirty, nappy hands, covered in pooey poos from a baby. I'm just as much with God there as what I do when I'm standing out here preaching. If only we could be like that. And then Revelation 21. I want to read this passage in closing. Last verse. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3. It says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. Notice it. Now God is with men and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Notice it again right at the end of time. But I want to tell you something. The only difference between this verse and what's happening now is geography. That's all. We can have that experience of with God right now. But this verse is talking about a new geography. We're in a new land, a new place. That's the only difference. We can experience that same joy and that same presence of being with God. And I tell you, I had to put that into practice over the, over the last week, what I'm saying today, because I, I, I wasn't going to say this, but I have inherited a little problem from my dad. He had atrial fibrillation, which means the heart races. And that's why sometimes I move a lot at the front here because I, I get wound up, especially when adrenaline starts to pump and the heart gets a bit erratic. And when I was having that bad cough and asthma all choked up, I took a lot of cough medicine and a lot of um, Ventolin. And of course, you know what that does to the heart, it speeds it up. And on, on Thursday, I thought I was going to die. They just went berserk. I remember sitting there thinking, you know, you don't have to worry because you're with God. I'm with him. And no matter what I'm doing in life, be it joyful things, be it successes, be it failures, or whatever it is, the aim of every Christian, I believe, is to live that life with God. May God bless you.